In June 1876, as the Cheyenne fought against Officer George Custer's men, one of Cheyenne's warriors comes in sight, was in great danger. He was left abandoned on the battlefield after his horse was shot out from under him. Then a rider appeared to save the day. She slung the now vulnerable Cums in sight onto her horse and took him to safety, dashing past hostile fire. Her name was Buffalo Calf Road Woman, the sister of the warrior. Although this battle is commonly known as the Battle of the Rosebud by white men, the Cheyenne people call it the battle where the girl saved her brother. A few days later, Buffalo Calf became the sole female soldier to fight at the Battle of Little Bighorn, riding near her husband and firing a six-shooter. Did Buffalo Calf deliver the fatal blow that killed Custer? Many descendants of the warriors who engaged in that bloody battle believe she was. In today's episode of Native Journal, we'll talk about the badass Native American warrior Buffalo Calf Road Woman, who many believe killed the mighty George Custer. But before we proceed, like and click on the subscribe button channel to immediately receive a notification whenever our new videos drop. Now let us get back to the video. As far as the history of battle is concerned, the fact is that women have always been active participants as fighters in the defense of their children, their families, their tribes, and their nation. However, throughout the decades, the writers of history, who were almost invariably men, have failed to give women as much credit as they should have for their contributions to the process of combat. Without a doubt, this is the case with Native American women, who are warriors. In the present day, research and scholarship, the unearthing of long-concealed papers, archaeology and diaries, are exposing more and more that women fought heroically and ferociously for the people they loved and the causes they believed in. This particular field of history demonstrates strikingly that history, as well as the recording of history, is a living, breathing phenomenon. We cannot take as gospel what we read in our elementary school textbooks and what we saw in Hollywood movies growing up. We have never learned the following from Hollywood or history books. At the Battle of the Little Bighorn, also known as Custer's Last Stand, female Cheyenne and Arapaho warriors distinguished themselves against their male counterparts. Buffalo Calf Road Woman, a Cheyenne warrior, was involved in several conflicts and according to tribe mythology that has been passed down for 143 years, she is credited with murdering George Armstrong Custer. Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer led an army expedition that discovered gold in the Black Hills in South Dakota in 1874. According to a treaty that both parties signed six years earlier, the Sioux Nation owned the hills during that period, which the United States of America acknowledged. When the Grant administration attempted to purchase the mountains, the Sioux refused to sell them because they believed they were sacred land. In 1876, federal troops were sent to the Great Plains to force the Sioux to relocate to reservations and to bring peace to the region. In June of the same year, Custer launched an assault on a Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho encampment that was located on the Little Bighorn River in the region that is now known as Montana. The Battle of the Little Bighorn is one of the most researched engagements in the history of the United States military. The vast amount of material written about this event mainly focuses on answering questions concerning Custer's behavior as a general during the conflict. However, neither he nor the 209 soldiers under his immediate command made it through the day. An Indian counterattack would eventually pin down seven companies of their fellow 7th cavalrymen on a mountaintop that was more than four miles away. Before the Indians halted their siege the following day, 53 of the approximately 400 troops who were stationed on the hilltop were dead and 60 of them were injured. Buffalo Calf Road Woman was one of the many women who fought on the side of the Native Americans, despite the majority of fighters on both sides being male. Around the year 1850, Buffalo Calf Road Woman was born. She belonged to the Northern Cheyenne Nation, and she lived during a time when the United States military was committing genocide against indigenous people through a campaign of murder, harassment, and forced relocation. Her ferocious combat abilities were well known, and she was known by several names, including Buffalo Calf Robe, Buffalo Calf Trail Woman, and Brave Woman. In 2005, Northern Cheyenne storytellers broke their silence regarding the combat, which had lasted for more than a century. They reported that Buffalo Calf Road Woman was the one who delivered the blow that knocked Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer off his horse before he passed away. On 25th June 1876, as men and boys started putting the horses out to graze, the sun was just beginning to push its way over the horizon. For the women, the first light was also the moment to start the cooking fire they had started the previous night. After some time, the hunk papa lady, known as Good White Buffalo Lady, 
stated that she had frequently been in camps when war was in the air, but that day was unlike what she had previously experienced. The Sioux that morning had no thought of fighting, she said. We expected no attack. Those who witnessed the campsite that had been assembled stated that they had never seen a larger one. According to He Dog, an Oglala warrior, it had come together in March or April, even before the plains began to green up. There were reports that soldiers were coming out to battle, and as a result, the various camps made it a point to stay close together. These reports came from Indians who had arrived from faraway reservations on the Missouri River. The Cheyennes were located at the northern, or downriver, end near the large ford where Medicine Tail Coulee and Muskrat Creek spilled into the Little Bighorn River. There were at least six, and perhaps seven, clustered together near one another. On the other hand, the Hunk Puppers were located at the southernmost point of the Sioux tribe. The Sans Arc, Brule, Minaconjou, Santé, and Oglala rivers, which were present along the river's bends and loops, separated them. According to some people, the Hunk Papa were considered the next largest group, with approximately 700 lodges between them. Between 500 and 600 lodges could have been found in the other circles. From this, it would appear that there are as many as 6,000 to 7,000 people in total, with a third of them being males or young boys of fighting age. A steady influx of individuals coming and going from the reservations made the subject of numbers challenging to pinpoint. An informal early warning system comprised these travelers, hunters from the camps, women who were out gathering roots and herbs, and others who were looking for horses that had gone missing. The dances that had been going on the night before had only ceased at the break of dawn, which is why many people woke up late this morning. The elders, who were referred to as chiefs by the whites but were referred to as short hairs, silent eaters, or big bellies by the Indians, were gathered in a huge tent that was located nearly in the middle of the village, possibly two lodges that were raised next to each other. Large numbers of adults and children went swimming in the river as the temperature rose and became more humid. According to Black Elk, the future Oglala holy man, who was just 12 years old at the time, the water would have been chilly. He would recall that the river was high because runoff from the mountains had accumulated. People at the southernmost end of the Hunk Papa camp were shouting alarms at the sight of approaching troops initially seen in a line on horseback a mile away. Ten or fifteen minutes after three o'clock, the Indians had already begun to emerge from their lodges to meet them. The first bullets came, which were heard back at the council lodge. Bullets sounded like hail on teepees and treetops, said Little Soldier, a Hunk Papa warrior. Close to their lodge, which was outside of the camp, gunfire killed Chief Gaul's family which consisted of two women and their three children. The Indians, however, were now coming out and firing back, which was sufficient to stop the ongoing assault. The whites disembarked from their horses. Every fourth man took the reins of three other horses and led them, along with his own, into the trees near the river. The remaining soldiers formed a skirmish line consisting of approximately 100 men. Everything was taking place in a very short amount of time. While the Indians were coming out to meet the skirmish line straight ahead, the river was on their left, hidden by heavy wood and brush. The soldiers were swooping around the end of the line while swinging wide with their swords. Some Indians, including He Dog and Braveheart, rode out even further, circling a small hill behind the soldiers. At that point, the troops had already started to turn around and confront the Indians who were standing behind them. It appeared as though the line had come to a complete halt. The firing was intense and quick, but the Indians who were racing their horses were difficult to hit. As the number of men who were rushing out to meet the military continued to increase, women and children were fleeing the area. Within 15 to 20 minutes of the beginning of the battle, the Indians were gaining control of the field, and the Europeans were retreating into the trees that lined the river. A pattern had already been established for the Battle of the Little Bighorn, which consisted of moments of fierce fighting, rapid movement, and tight battle with soldiers falling dead or wounded followed by sudden relative stillness. At the same time, the two sides collected themselves, took stock of their situation, and prepared for the next confrontation. As the troops vanished into the forest, Indians warily moved in after them in groups of one or two while others collected in the vicinity. Although the shooting slowed down, it never stopped. Most women and children left the Hunkpapa camp and moved north down the river. At the same time, a growing stream of men were passing them on their way to the fighting, where the excitement was going on, according to Eagle Elk, a friend of Red Feather, Crazy Horse's brother-in-law. Both of these movements were taking place simultaneously. Around the same time, Crazy Horse, 
who was already well known among the Oglala for his mastery in combat, was making his way toward where the fighting was taking place. Bullets clattered through tree limbs and sent leaves fluttering to the ground as Crazy Horse caught up with his cousins, Kicking Bear and Red Feather. It was difficult to see the troops in the trees by the time Crazy Horse caught up with them, but there was a lot of shooting going on. At that point, several Native Americans had already been killed and others had been injured. During the time that Custer's forces were making their way from the river to higher ground, the area on three sides was rapidly filling with Indians, who were effectively pushing as well as following the soldiers uphill. This is what Shave Elk had to say about the situation. We chased the soldiers up a long, gradual slope or hill in a direction away from the river and over the ridge where the battle began in good earnest. The Indians had already begun to populate the coolies to the south and east when the soldiers took their stand on the ridge, the backbone connecting the Calhoun Hills and the Custer Hills. The officers tried their utmost to keep the soldiers together at this point, said Red Hawk, but the horses were unmanageable. They would rear up and fall backward with their riders. Some would get away. Crow King said, when they saw that they were surrounded, they dismounted. This was true to the letter of the cavalry's tactics. In order to take a stand or keep up a strong defense, no alternative avenue was available. Then, a brief period of purposeful warfare took place on foot. As soon as the Indians arrived, they dismounted their horses, searched for cover, and started moving toward the soldiers. To conceal themselves, the Indians made their way uphill on hands and knees, as Red Feather put it. They took advantage of the brush and any little swale or rise in the ground. In a single instant, the Indians would suddenly rise to shoot and immediately fall back down again. There was not a single man on either side who could show himself without attracting fire. When they were engaged in combat, the Indians would wear their feathers down flat to aid in camouflage. The soldiers appear to have removed their hats for the same reason. Several Indians observed soldiers who were not wearing their hats, some of whom were dead, and others who were still engaged in combat. The conflict was fierce and brutal, and would sometimes involve hand-to-hand -hand combat. Both knives and clubs, in addition to gunshots, were used to kill men. In the moments before he was murdered himself, the Cheyenne Brave Bear witnessed an officer on a brown horse shoot two Indians with his handgun. The Bear of Courage was successful in seizing the horse. At nearly the same time, Yellow Nose forcibly removed a cavalry guidon from the hands of a soldier who had been employing it as a weapon. During the intense combat that took place at Calhoun Hill, Eagle Elk witnessed a significant number of men being killed or terribly injured. One of the Indians was shot through the jaw and was all bloody. Half of Custer's soldiers had already been killed at this point. The Indians were closing in from all directions, and the horses had either been killed, injured, or fled the battlefield. It was impossible to conceal oneself. When the horses got to the top of the ridge, the Grey Ones and Bays became mingled, and the soldiers with them were all in confusion, said Foolish Elk. After that, he added something that no white soldier ever lived to tell. The Indians were so numerous that the soldiers could not go any further, and they knew that they had to die. From downriver, where they had been chasing horses, from along the ridge, where they had stripped the dead of guns and ammunition, and from upriver, where Reno's men could hear the beginning of the last heavy volley a few minutes past five o'clock, the Indians who had surrounded the soldiers on Custer Hill were now joined by others from every section of the surrounding field. There were great numbers of us, said Eagle Bear, an Oglala, some on horseback, others on foot. Back and forth in front of Custer we passed, firing all the time. The Cheyenne and Lakota who were allied under the command of Crazy Horse were retiring and as they did so, they abandoned the injured Chief Cums in sight, the brother of the Buffalo Woman, on the battlefield. On the spur of the moment, Buffalo Calf Road Woman sped out onto the battlefield at full speed, grabbed her brother, and carried him to safety. Her brave rescue sparked a rallying cry among the Cheyenne, which ultimately resulted in their victory over General George Crook and his forces. The Cheyenne referred to the Battle of Rosebud as the fight where the girl saved her brother, in order to pay tribute to Buffalo Calf Road Woman for her heroic actions. According to elderly Cheyennes who were still alive at the time, Two Southern Cheyenne women reportedly discovered Custer's body in the 1920s. The bullets had struck him in the head as well as in the side. One of the most well-known Cheyenne elders, a peace chief, a member of the tribal administration, and the National Historic Preservation representative of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma, provided the following additional information regarding the account of Buffalo Calf Road Woman. 
Cheyenne warrior Buffalo Calf Road Woman had fought a number of battles in leadership roles. At the Battle of the Little Big Horn, it is said she charged Custer, grabbed his saber, and stabbed him, knocking him off his horse and killing him. Afterward, Cheyenne and Arapaho women stabbed their awls in Custer's ears, chanting, You will listen to our people in the next world. They were avenged. Unfortunately, she and her family were in for a terrible end. She and her husband were effectively expelled from the clan as a result of her husband's actions, which included the shooting and killing of the chieftain, Black Crane, during the Northern Cheyenne Exodus. The following day, Black Coyote and two other Cheyenne men ambushed two United States soldiers along Mizpah Creek in Montana, resulting in the death of one of the soldiers. Soldiers from Fort Keo went on a hunt for the family, and they were eventually apprehended on 10th April, 1879, five days after they had been located. This series of events came to be known as the Mizpah Creek Incidents. A small group was transported to Miles City, Montana, where the three men, including Black Coyote, were brought before a judge and prosecuted for murder. The execution was planned to take place on 8th June, 1879. In May the previous month, Buffalo Calf Road Woman passed away in Miles City, Montana, from either diphtheria or malaria. Her husband was incarcerated at the time. The news of this led Black Coyote to commit suicide by hanging himself in prison. Thank you for staying with us to the end. If you enjoyed this video, kindly hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to get notifications on all our new videos. Also, remember to share this video. Have a lovely day.